A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 94th edition of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. It's been over a year now that we have had this series of webinars. A little over a year ago, we were hearing the first signs of the COVID pandemic affecting our country. Schools had shut down and teachers were quickly coming to terms with new methods of education. The Zoom platform being one of them. We at Notebook felt that it was our responsibility to bring together the educators community and have them more experienced with the Zoom platform. That is what Together for Education was set up with as a guiding thought. Today, more than a year later, this has become far more than that. Together for Education is a community of educators that more than 70,000 educators around the world are now a part of. We have been privileged to have expert opinions and thoughts on a range of topics. Topics ranging from extremely curricular, the NEP, to the extracurricular, like sports and games in schools, to topics like mental health. And today, we look at some wide spectrum topics. We look at climate action in schools. Climate action has been something of an important point globally over the last couple of decades. About two decades ago, it was felt that we as human beings had taken nature for granted and our actions were destroying chances of future generations to see the world as we see it today. Therefore, there was need for positive action, positive impact to be made on the climate. Recently, the United Nations adopted 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Goal number 13 talks about climate action and our schools the world over have become a part of a drive to empower and enable these SDGs. Today, we'll look at how our schools in India are looking at climate action, especially now that the pandemic is in, in, in its second wave. We will explore how our schools and our students can continue to strive to make the world livable for generations to come. Our first speaker today is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Doon School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education. He served the Doon School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of student welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Doon School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He is also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we at Notebook are privileged to have him on a panel of advisors. Sir, sure. so, privileged to have you here with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Abayu, for that introduction. <clears throat> and a very good evening to you, the Notebook team, Achin, Meghna, Abhishek, and all the rest of them. Also, very good evening to um, the panel, uh, some of whom I have not seen for many years. Mr. Ray, welcome and Mrs. Shahag, who I have heard so much about but not uh, met, and Mrs. Uh, Oja, and all those uh, people who have tuned in this evening. So, um, you know, when I grew up in school, which is almost 50 years ago, um, we studied climate and geography and enjoyed the changing seasons. We got our vitamin D without uh, a second thought of skin cancer and played in the dirtiest of pools without getting any gastric problems. I drank tap water till almost in my early 20s. Uh, fridges only came into my life when I was about nine years old. Uh, we cooked on coal and things like aquaguard and bottled water and global warming, we hadn't even heard of. But it is my generation, the baby boomers, who are currently heading countries and nations and who are calling the shots, who have probably destroyed this planet for the generations Y and Zs who are now, you know, wanting to take over. Uh, it was my academically, these are the academically charged up post-war generation, uh, you know, who while, made, who while they made great strides, a very positive scientific development, also invented fast foods, gadgets, and the gizmos that has now brought the planet to its knees. We cannot blame the youth because they're inheriting a world that is fast dying and are fearful that this earth will not be able to sustain the, the, the life um, that they know. And uh, will they reach adulthood you know, safely? The baby boomers 
have had all their fun. And we in the autumn of our lives uh, are looking back to see what we can leave our grandchildren. Is it too late? Can things be done at this later? Would doing something now slow down the, the downward spiral? Well, Thomas Malthus in the 18th century was wrong when he said that the earth would not be able to sustain the growing population. It's proved wrong because scientists came up and discovered fertilizer, quick growing varieties. And today the earth is still, uh, you know, the population is growing and we still have enough food, thank God. Let's hope that something happens that uh, is going to change this world. And what is going to change this world is the youth, the youth of today, if they make enough noise. At least <clears throat> the current generation, thanks to the education they've had, the Algo videos and the environmental science classes, the media, and the availability of the science and the scientific data on Google have made this generation far more aware of what they are going to face than we were. It's the youth like Malala and Greta Thunberg and such other brave souls who are the new prophets. These are the people who are going to reach out and strike a chord with today's children. Talking about Greta, uh, Greta Thunberg, um, you know, who became the voice, the worldwide voice of a movement. Uh, <clears throat> on the March 15th, an estimated 1.4 million students in 112 countries around the world uh, heeded her call to skip school and demand that the environment be protected for their generation. I think righteous anger is what we need from our youth. They are angry, they want answers, and it is the political will that is missing because I think making money is still more important than saving the earth for many. We will yet be saved by our children, the very ones that we have not thought about the, one, the very ones who don't have enough water, they are going to save us. Now, we have all been very slow to heed the advice of these modern prophets and have been blind to the gradual rise in summer temperatures, the, the rise of new viruses, rising sea levels, the Arctic meltdown, the retreat of our own glaciers, whether, whether it's Gomo or Pindari. We have failed to see the increasing floods, the droughts, the forest fires, the bushfires in Australia, the falling water tables close by in, in Missouri, uh, the extinction of so many seed varieties, animal and bird species. The writing has been on the wall for many years, but we just aren't able to get up and do something about it. Um, <clears throat> we are still using the body sprays. We are still using, eating meat. We are still depleting ozone and our factories still spew out all those poisonous uh, effluence and we dump them in the sea. Yet, at the same time, much has been done by way of awareness, teaching, the anti-plastic movement is, you know, in full flow. We segregate our waste, we are cleaner fuels for our cars, the electric vehicles on the conveyor belt, on the, on the, uh, in the factories. Uh, we are aware of carbon footprints. Many of us have turned vegan and it is time we all turned away from our um, wasteful ways of life. Now, what can we do as teachers, educators, to make our school kids more aware of what's happening? The first is, I think, to teach climate and environmental sciences to kids at an early age. Awareness is the most important. I think most of them are aware of greenhouse gases, car pollution, alternative sources of energy, the plastic menace, etc. Climate science and global warming must be embedded in the curriculum and cut across all disciplines, whether it's literature, physics, geography, even history. We can learn about how the ancients of Rajasthan had water saving device, uh, techniques that we can learn from even today. I think it's important to have competition with sister and friendly schools in the, in the vicinity um, that belong to the same associations. You know, we have CBSC schools association, ICSC schools. We, we need to sit and think together. Uh, there are some schools that even have um, uh, competitions on um, how much their electricity and water bills are coming to. I know schools in Canada where they compete and see whether they can lower their water and electricity bills. 
in boarding schools, we can even have inter-house competitions to see which house you know, runs up the lowest bill. I think we need to involve children in school water harvesting and ongoing projects um, of, of that nature. Setting up environment clubs, showing them videos, movies on awareness, assembly talks, uh, getting people you know, to come and give talks, people who know what we are speaking about, trying to link up with people in other regions and see what they're doing about climate change. Uh, getting people like uh, Sonam Wangchuk to come and talk about what he's done in Ladakh, uh, exposing children to the ice stupas, and as I said earlier, the ancient tank systems in Rajasthan. I think also all schools must now be segregating waste, waste, um, uh, looking at compost spits, vermiculture, having organic gardens, uh, trying to make their and you know grow their own vegetables, helping children to work out their own carbon footprint and see if the school as a whole can decrease that carbon footprint. Encouraging children to walk to school, to get into carpools rather than come in private cars. Um, setting up a school by the station, which is now quite cheap these days electronically and keeping close watch on record so children can see for themselves the, the, the rising minimum and maximum temperatures each year. Kids love to link up with schools abroad, um, you know, have, a, have, a, have an exchange, a dialogue of ideas, talk about common projects that they're doing. Let us get involved with schools abroad, let schools abroad get involved with us, creating a sort of um, uh, the best practices. You know, what are they doing? Um, I think set days in a week where um, we, we need to sacrifice eating meat, uh, sacrifice uh, coming by a car, let's walk to school. Um, having tree planting drives on the weekend, um, trying to help children save water by having water saving devices in the school, drip irrigations to all the playing fields, uh, teaching them to turn off taps, uh, using their personal water bottles rather than using cups and, uh, and plastic uh, you know, utensils. I think it's important to inculcate in the children the three R's. That is reduction of waste, reuse of resources, and recycling of materials. I think it should be put up on all schools. As I said earlier, awareness of the rising temperatures, minimum and maximum each year, rising sea levels, let them see it for themselves, retreating glaciers, rainfall figures. Let's see how, uh, how much they know about landslides and are these landslides and droughts increasing? Now, Community service is a very, very big thing because here we can stress on helping people at the same time learn about weather and what's happening in, in their local communities, like helping children to clean up riverbeds, remove plastics, saving water in summer, anything that allows children to see how the world outside their class is responding to and is affected by global warming is, is, is a good, is good education. Um, our boys <clears throat> were aware that there were lines outside school, lines, uh, you know, collecting water from one tap, while in the school that I worked in, there, there were, there were uh, uh, six boys to a bathroom, you know, sitting under the shower. Uh, there was no awareness there, but I think once they got to know and saw the lines of people waiting for a tap, they, it affected them. Now, in the school I lost, uh, in, in the Doon School where I worked, we, we did a lot of things. We, we, had, um, uh, we had an organic garden, we had vermiculture, we planted trees all over the Doon Valley. We had our own paper recycling unit. We had water harvesting pits. All our houses have water harvesting. Uh, all buildings built after 2000 were TIRI certified. That is the Energy and Resource uh, Institute, previously known as the Tata Energy and Resource Institute. We were given green ratings. Our school was certified a green school. So it's important that all new construction be certified. We allowed natural light to enter workspaces. So we saved on electricity. Walls were insulated so that we didn't need heating in winter. And um, there were air vents to catch breeze from the hills um, you know, during um, 
during summer. Uh, the school also sort of went paperless by the year 2030 as computers took over. We also had a project uh, in a village not far from Dune where the boys learned to take a stream which they diverted and they used the stream not only to turn water wheels and produce electricity but also to run a flour mill. It helped, it helped a family, eight families to set up fisheries uh, there was a goat herd who helped, they helped him to, to, to get fodder. Uh, there was a flour mill, as I said, which ground wheat. Uh, electricity was produced. Uh, one family went into poultry and uh, sold their eggs. Um, and then when the water was led through the eight toilets that the boys constructed, it then was taken back to the stream uh, uh, so that we didn't waste the water. We used the water and returned it back to the, mill, to the mother stream. In the end, what I want to say is that um, <clears throat> climate education should be aimed at making children aware of what is happening. You cannot expect everyone to respond in the same way, but some will be affected greatly and make life changes. At this juncture, there's no point blaming people and who caused the state we are in, just that it is up to us to slow things down. And awareness is important. Look at how the COVID and all the news around it has made us forget issues like dengue and global warming because it doesn't directly touch our hearts. Similarly, what we have to do is not let global warming move away from our consciousness. We've got to keep it there and chip, a, and chip away at it continuously. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Shobayu. Thank you so much for listening. I hope I've made some sense in this. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, calling that just some sense would be a gross understatement. Uh, as you were talking about using videos and movies, I could only think that uh, I think 1990 to 1996, for seven years, CBS in the US ran with a program called Captain Planet and the Planeteers, where there was a superhero character who was trying to save the planet. And then they discontinued, uh, discontinued the program in 1996. Uh, today, I just wish uh, directors like Nolan beyond their Batman franchise would also look at Captain America as an idea to franchise. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to move on to our second speaker. Our second speaker today is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a fellow of the ICI and a member of CPA Australia. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Should I am audible? Yes, love it. I once again welcome all of you to today's session on a topic which impacts each one of us here today and also our future generations. Our planet has already irrevocably changed as a result of human made emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases. Today, in line with predictions made for decades now, so we have been hearing about this for a long time, we are seeing increasing temperatures, dramatic weather swings, devastating droughts, wildfires, huge storms, flooding, sea level rising, different parts of the world, warming, and acidic oceans. And we are also seeing uh, an enormous animal and plant extinction, and many more. Right? We could we could go on and on. Now, our planet has warmed at least one degree Celsius, which is around one point eight degree Fahrenheit, since pre-industrial area, pre-industrial period. And if we look at temperatures, we'll see that 
2020 and 2016 were the hottest years in recorded history. Now, research indicates that global temperatures may increase by four degrees Celsius as early as 2017 and perhaps even much sooner. Now, what does this mean when we say uh, rise by four degrees Celsius? This means that it would potentially permanently devastate food production. Now, this is only one of the consequences, right? In many parts of the world. The Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets have already begun to melt and break apart. Now, we have been again hearing this for years now. Now, no matter what we do, undoubtedly sea levels are going to rise substantially if this happens. And many of the largest cities in around the world, uh, Florida, for instance, will first be subjected to storm surges and then inundated. And this will happen in many parts of the world. Now, there is no going back. Each, uh, for instance, each gallon of gasoline burn represents 100 tons of ancient plants and carbon. They captured being returned to the atmosphere. Now, if you look at the impact, like for instance, when carbon dioxide is released into the air, it continues to affect the climate for hundreds, even thousands of years. Now, we are, we are surely on a, currently we are on a trajectory to four degrees Celsius or more, like what we are referring to, the rise, potential rise in temperature and the catastrophic consequences. Now it is imperative to change what we're doing and try and limit this temperature rise to somewhere around two degrees Celsius. Now it is not certain that even with focused world attention on greenhouse gas reduction, that two degrees is still possible, but definitely we need to give it our best shot for the sake of human race and life on this planet. We must nonetheless do everything within our powers to limit global warming as much as possible. Now, I was reading to a, to a very, also very insightful quote that, that really sums this the whole thing very nicely, very appropriately. And this is by, by one of uh, the world's most, you know, one of the most influential climate scientists. And very apt, the quote says, the difference between two and four degrees is human civilization. I repeat, the difference between two and four degrees is human civilization. That explains the impact of this continuous rise in temperature. Now, whatever happens, climate change will be the defining feature of the world that, that our students are going to inhabit in future, right? Inherit. Thus, addressing climate change, I believe, is everyone's responsibility. So, in fact, I was going through a very uh, recent uh, UN report, United Nations report, which found that uh, people must cut greenhouse gas emissions at least by 50% by 2030. If we, if, if we hope to avoid the catastrophic climate impacts, now cutting by 50% is a huge task, and that too by 2030. Undoubtedly, humans impact the climate, right? By making the earth grow continually warmer. Indeed, you know, the planet absorbs a lot of heat. So another very, uh, uh, very insightful data I was uh, going through, which says that scientists have calculated that in recent years, the earth has been gaining as much heat every day, I repeat, as much heat every day as would be released by four lakh Hiroshima atom bombs. So that means the impact that four lakh atom bombs would have had, the kind of heat every day the planet is gaining. Now, human emissions cause 
the increased warming and natural feedback loop spreads it even faster now for instance the uh, another very important aspect is we all know that ice and snow reflect around 70% of solar energy while open ocean absorbs around 95% so as polar ice caps melt and expose more oceans a great deal more heat is absorbed and naturally global warming is accelerated and that that's a natural process right again warming by human emissions as you all know releases methane which is a greenhouse gas from from ocean beds again accelerating warming now global warming uh undoubtedly will have a very devastating impact in every country current understanding indicates that this will lead to mass mass starvation because we were discussing about food reserves we were discussing about food production getting impacted mass flooding we were discussing about water level rising naturally this will lead to huge migration people have been forced people being uprooted and also unfortunately may lead to loss of lives perhaps many and naturally people in developing countries and people with access to lesser resources will be more impacted as always now very recently i was going through some incidents very recently and an entire lake in bolivia which was quite big you know the, the lake almost twice the size of los angeles is now completely dry bone dry in fact resulting in residents having to flee so you can imagine the impact another example i'll give you the largest city in the western hemisphere with 20 million residents now i am discussing about sao paulo brazil is close to running out of water so imagine like a city of 20 million residents running out of water what that means consequences are huge catastrophic almost again another uh, example due to rising sea levels many of the marshall islands and even you know our next door neighbor coastal regions of bangladesh are underwater or soon will be underwater now we all know that some of the first to suffer as always and endure the worst effect will be the poorer countries nations that have the least responsibility for the pollution that that is causing the climate change because unfortunately many of these countries are too small or they are not that industrially developed that they are contributing to the pollution so they are not contributing to the pollution but unfortunately they are going to be the worst sufferers their contribution may be minimal but the impact that they are going to bear is going to be maximum now so actually the impact of climate change will be unfair and unbalanced the first time uh, this issue came to the surface was uh, as we all would remember many of us in educators in this forum would remember 2006 uh, movie an inconvenient truth so this was uh, a project of a uh, project by a uh, former uh, us vice president al gore now this really pushed climate change into into the forefront of national consciousness so everywhere you know suddenly there was much more much more discussions about it now coming to coming to students i believe the current generation of high school and you know college going young adults are the first ones who have really grown up with an awareness about climate change and potential consequences naturally the levels of awareness have really increased Now, the, but, the, but the question is that how does this generation perceive climate change and its its own future given that perception and how does education in climate change alter that perception alter those perception what is the perception and the role of education so we all know that we were discussing about the impact and and we can go on and on 
the impact is so huge, be it in terms of air pollution, be it in terms of uh, mass extinction. As we were discussing about more than 200 species going extinct every single day. Now, but, but we find very less discussion in this topic, whether that, that be in our media, on, on different circles. Say for, for example, topics like equity or, or climate justice, clearly stated everywhere uh, in, in, in the Paris Agreement. If you look at the Paris Accord about which there was a lot of discussions recently. But honestly, most, the, the vast majority of people do not bother. But the question is why, why they don't bother? Also because they don't have a clue about the actual consequences and how it is going to impact them. So unless and they are aware about the impact, naturally they will not bother. Now, we all understand that industrialization, mass production, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a huge downside to it. For instance, today we use uh, more than 100 million barrels of oil every single day. So you can understand that the impact, right? Now, again, uh, supporting, coming to students, supporting students today in learning about climate change and providing them the opportunity to explore and consider climate solutions, I believe will, will, will increase resilience. Resilience of our society because naturally these students, they're going to be the custodians, they're going to be the decision makers, right? Policy makers. Now, and, and they will have to, and they don't have a choice. They will have to navigate a world deeply impacted by climate change. So naturally they need to learn about it. And not only from a scientific perspective, but also from a social and economic perspective. What are the social and economic consequences of the same? Of planet warming, our, our, our shorelines vanishing. What is the economic impact? What is the social impact? Now, unless until they think critically about climate change and aspects like green economy. So I believe that because again, climate scientists, for instance, have repeatedly made it clear that the whole reason why this is occurring is because of human activity. Now, fortunately, you know, I take great pride in saying this, that India is one of the few countries where environment education is compulsory at all levels of formal education. So earlier there was the Apex Court ruling post which these changes have come in. And, and you all know that the concept introduced at schools are centered on the need to conserve for future generations about resource depletion, the fact that we need to halt it, reduce pollution, uh, need for protecting wildlife. But I believe in days to come, we should see more focus on effects of greenhouse gases, you know, topics of immediate concern, like Im impact of chlorofluorocarbons, et cetera. And environmental education cannot be lim merely limited to facts and figures. I believe more, more specific, for instance, environmental problems, say be it at the national, state, city, or district level, needs to be emphasized in a real life case study so that students are much more involved. They can relate to the issue. So efforts to capture a complexity, uh, inter the fact that they're interconnected, and different perspectives, perspectives to a problem, like as we were discussing, be it, be it the social perspective, the economic perspective, the ecological perspective, the gender perspective will definitely help. It will help in steering students away from creating, you know, black and white scenarios of the problem. They'll refer to the drivers, the solutions. So this year, for instance, 2021, a very important event, COP26, COP26. World leaders are gearing up for this. I think towards the end of the year, United Nations Climate Change Conference. So we see that around the world, uh, people are people are definitely trying to take steps, waking up to this. So I believe the need of the hour is to move from environmental education to to towards a more climate change and skill for a more green future. To go beyond textbooks. When students will realize how how closely linked environmental issues are to their to their lives and future, so that they are more motivated to 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 conceive solutions.
to this end students should be encouraged and to get more involved in aspects like for instance uh, citizen science uh, experiential learning now citizen science for instance uh, introduces students to the rigors of scientific assessment and the difficulties associated with conservation efforts now again uh, i believe teaching aspects I, we have a great panel here today and birds also mentioned some very good points so naturally the the uh, practical aspect of it in terms of how this is being handled and this needs to be handled i of course i leave this to the panel but just a few one or two points from my side i believe teaching should go beyond a textbook to to more you know simulations field trips uh, visiting environmentalists and inviting inviting your lecturers who can also share the real life perspective ground reality and student uh, field trips be it on be it in sanctuaries uh, drainage system rivers also you know activities like museum visit informal learning centers places like local science museums you know great place to tackle climate change and to really understand another very important aspects uh, aspect i was going through is uh, the concept of green jobs now this is another very important topic about uh, skilling up for green job now realizing uh, the need for conserving biodiversity aspects like uh, arresting habitat loss reducing pollution addressing climate change so nationally all over the world governments have all governments have formulated lot of uh, lot of green plans for economic recovery after covid pandemic for instance i was going through a document called uh, the european uh, green deal also indonesia's uh, medium term development plan which is from 20, 2020 to 2024 again colombia's ecosystem based disaster risk education roadmap so these are some efforts towards uh, creation of you know a creation of green jobs taking proper steps in this regard and these measures really demonstrate the commitment of governments to build back better by transitioning to less carbon intensive economies while conserving nature and creating green jobs however uh, the successful implementation of these plans really require a more i'll say a trained and skilled workforce so naturally uh, there is no scope in this particular sector as well to take it up as a career in future different different and you know this kind of career choices will not only contribute to the student in terms of a, a great career but also socially very relevant in terms of giving back to the society in terms of really contributing to the planet so i believe even if uh, half of our students take up climate issues seriously in the future it will provide huge impetus uh, to our fight against climate change also beyond schools like you know undergraduate courses various disciplines especially that uh, the the technical courses so th- which can really equip students with the skills and techniques needed needed for building a uh, green job ready workforce jobs that contribute to conservation preservation and restoration of environmental quality now uh, green jobs all over the world i was going to some reports of uh, international renewable energy agency this says that green jobs are on the rise across the world and many young job seekers are interested in environmentally conscious businesses as well a lot of startups happening in this area now this requires environment and climate literacy training and civic skills and now really very attractive sector to start you know a, a very i'll say very uh, fulfilling job very emotionally satisfying job in the future a great sector that we are looking at so as we have discussed like uh, if i just sum it up few needs of the hour first and foremost i think very important uh, for grounding the climate crisis as so really building an awareness that this is one of the most important issues second is uh, for young children to understand the causes and effects okay this is happening but why is this happening what are the causes and how is it affecting me 
uh, both locally as well as globally. Third, I think uh, overcoming individualism and nationalism, this is something that we really need to look at more from a global perspective. So adopting a more system-based global perspective approach because something which is happening somewhere else will impact me, if not today, but tomorrow for sure. Again, another very important aspect, creating solidarity with the oppressed and the exploited. Like I was telling you that poorer nations who have contributed less uh, to polluting the planet are going to bear the maximum burnt of it. Again, envisioning and enacting transformational changes through individual and again, collaborative action. So a very, uh, very renowned climate scientist, Catherine Hill, you know, I was going through and very nicely put, it says that the key to having a real discussion is to connect over shared values. And according to Catherine, we can't give in to despair. We have to go out and look for the hope. We have to really look for the hope. We need to, we need to inspire, which, you know, the hope that we need, which can really inspire us to act. And the hope begins, and the hope begins with a conversation today. So we need to start conversing, we need to start talking, we need to start reaching out and raise this issue. So these are some points that I wanted to make. I thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing. We are a very, uh, very experienced panel today. And I really look forward to the deliberation on this very important topic. Over to you, Shubhai. Thank you, Achin. Thank you for that wonderful presentation with stories from around the globe. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Ochin mentioned, we do have a stellar panel lined up for you. But before we introduce you to the panel today, a little bit about Notebook. We at Notebook are an edtech organization. We make short videos pertaining to the school syllabus. These videos come in handy in two scenarios. One, when you as an educator are taking your class, you have access to these videos to play at the beginning of a lesson. These give your students a very visual understanding of the topic that you are going to discuss. During the last one year, a lot of teachers have in fact sent links to the videos to the students two days before the class so that students could prepare in a flipped classroom model and then come prepared with their questions at the beginning of a session. Months later, these videos, these same videos come in handy to the students who have access to these videos on their personal devices. So a student at home can access these videos on any smartphone or laptop that they have access to and they can then use these videos to revise what was taught in class that day. What I'm going to do now is play you a short segment of one of the notebook videos. Given the topic that we are discussing today, and like Mr. Barak mentioned, that a topic has taken place, uh, found its place in the CBSA syllabus. Here is the class 10 chapter of sustainable management of natural resources. Hello, and welcome to Notebook. In multiple videos, we have spoken of preserving our resources and acting sustainably. I'm sure you also keep hearing about this in news and in people's conversation as well. Why do we need to be sustainable? Why haven't we been sustainable all this while? Do you think sustainability is a new age concept? Sustainable living has been an integral part of India's culture since the Vedic ages. Ancient civilization in India were based on vernacular or localized systems that took care of supporting its surroundings and maintaining harmony in nature. Be practices like water harvesting, seasonal crop rotation, passive cooling systems, Indians have used scientific and sharp methods to support, sustain and protect are natural resources like forests, wildlife, water, coal, petroleum, etc. We use every part of a plant for our use. Take the coconut or banana plant, for example. Our elders use and reuse the same containers for things like spices, pickles, etc. Indian daily practices inherently follow the now popular system of five R's. Refuse, say no to things you don't need or that can harm you or the environment. Say no to single use items. Reduce, use less. Save resources like electricity, water, 
food in other words do not waste reuse the simple act of using things repeatedly avoiding single use and throw items reusing is actually more effective than recycling as it does not use excess energy for the process recycling the collection of plastic paper glass and metal items to recycle instead of synthesizing or extracting freshly again repurpose think of other ways a product can be used or refurbished when its current utility comes to an end sustainable development encourages forms of growth social economic and ecological well ladies and gentlemen that was a short clip of one of the notebook videos i thank you for your patience with that we will now move on to the panel discussion that we have at hand we need have a stellar panel with us today i will take just a couple of minutes to introduce our speakers to you we have with us dr preeti ojha who is a leader a passionate facilitator a co-learner and a teacher coach she is at present working as the principal of delhi international school in sector 23 dwarka new delhi she has an experience of 18 years in school profile starting her career as a primary teacher and today serving as a principal is a journey she has completed with endless stories she is a postgraduate in computer science from pune university dr preeti went on to complete bed mphil and phd in computer science in her zeal to acquire the theoretical moorings of training and teaching she has received award for most progressive principal in national convention of educational leaders and most promising principal by global leaders foundation she has recently been recognized as the linkedin spotlight 2019 she started her career as a software coder at a reputed software firm eventually she took up a profile of a teacher in a school sector as a heart would always get attracted to young minds query and inquisitively she has been working since 18 years in various reputed schools as a faculty and later as an administrator she worked with british council north india schools team international coordinator local facilitator she is master trainer and course core skills trainer for various modules she has conducted numerous workshops for teachers leaders and other stakeholders in education sector within india and abroad her journey as a teacher has helped her to be a leader her quest to resolve issues of students teachers parents and management give her the satisfaction of learning through each solution and at a micro level contribute to the system ma'am thank you so much for making the time and being with us today we have with us also mr jonajit ray who is an experienced and noted child focused school educator management professional consultant and author passionately committed to contributing substantially towards empowering young people in realizing their fullest potential by enabling them to look for creative alternatives and solutions in an ever evolving environment he has always endeavored to be involved in the paradigm shift in schooling from the existing adult directed content based exam oriented one size fits all cattle class environments for mindless tracks transaction of syllabus that present day schools have become to the student centered skills based inquiry oriented personalized model of creative learning he is at present employed as the executive director of pratichi institute pratichi india trust kolkata since 2019 His primary calling, however, has been in the sphere of private school education for over three decades. He has served several distinguished schools, such as the Doon School, Oak Ridge International School, where he was the founder principal, Yadavendra Public School, and many other institutions in various professional capacities. He has worked for schools not only affiliated to national boards, like the Council of Indian School Certificate Examination or Central Board of Secondary Education, and the National Institute of Open Schooling, but also authorized by international education bodies like the ibo and cambridge assessment international education as an alumnus of rabindranath tagore's vishwa bharati in shantini ketan and a 21st century educationist it is his deepest conviction that the conscious inculcation of love and respect for the natural environment as well as the delicate balance of all its different elements constitutes one of the prime pillars of good schooling so privileged to have you with us today thank you so much for making the time we also have with us mr rajesh shyam who is the principal of the fab india school who believes creativity is much more than just a skill she feels committed to introduce skills at a young age to promote entrepreneurship this kind of education she believes will generate job creators instead of job seekers she loves to inspire engage and encourage students by diverging creative thinking and problem solving abilities to bring out the best learning in and outside the classroom She obtained her master's degree in English and psychology. 
She did her undergraduate work in physical education, specializing in swimming, and began her career at the American Embassy School in New Delhi, and worked as an educator at schools like Mayo College Girls School Ajmer, Pathways World School Gurgaon, and the Indian High School in Dubai. Her motto is collaborative school environment, creating successful teachers and students by partnering with parents and the community to enrich the experience of learning. Ma'am, thank you so much for making the time and being with us today. I shall stop the share now, switch on my camera so that we can see each other and have a wonderful discussion. Once again, thank you so much for being here. It's a privilege to play host to all of you. Uh, Dr. Preeti, if I may come to you first. Yes. Um, at your school, how do you teach children to be more climate conscious? Um, I treat a school and bifurcate in its thinking skills at four levels. That's the pre-primary level and then the primary, middle and the senior. And whenever I look at these children, the curiosity level is higher in them when they're observing each other and the surrounding. And um, if I talk about the journey of myself as a school teacher and then a leader, I realize wherever, whatever one individual as an adult is doing, our observations might reduce a little, but the kids' observation in the school is very high. So in case you have a thought and you have thought of climate action, you know that what is happening around the world, you have to first make them realize why should I do something for the nation or the world around them? Why should they do that? And the why of an individual as a human mind comes only when it's impacting them, as spoken by the previous two uh, mentors I just now heard. Until and unless it's not affecting you as an individual, you do not act or proactively start working towards a solution. This is how the human mind works, according to my experience. All my learned panelists are also here. I would like you to please throw some light when you talk about it. But I definitely have this feeling that I worked in a 40-year-old school to start as my career, and then I worked in a, a very new school, and then I worked in a school in a village in Kurukshetra, and I realized that, and that was a girl's residential school, I realized that the mindset of the children is the same, absolutely same. It is only that how the other stakeholders around them create an environment for them to learn. And you can't create children by telling them what to do. You have to give them an environment to understand the need of it, as I spoke in the early stage also. So I try at the very early stage to do the awareness, which is extremely important. So we have natural way, greenery around us, music, song, movie, and various other aspects where children try to understand what exactly is happening according to the curriculum. But so when we are designing a curriculum, we keep the, keep the climate change as an important aspect where ecosystem at their age level can be understood to them. We have flowers and plants and tags around it. A simple line, don't pluck it. You think, allow also others also not to pluck it. You know, such kind of information. When children read on their own, I think my education strategy starts the minute one child of the class starts telling the other child, don't pluck the flower. You know, I have done my 10% of classroom teaching. But when it comes to a child and they're told that let's make a bouquet, you're ironically teaching the child two different things. So you have to keep in mind as a teacher, as a coordinator, as a leader, that if you're not allowing them to pluck a flower, I'm talking about a very trivial thing in a school, but imagine the child's observation. The child will say, on one hand, you ask me not to pluck the flower. On the other hand, you ask me to make a bouquet. So what do you exactly want me to do? So we started with planters, and it's a very normal phenomenon. Now everybody has a planter. We have uh, planters usually uh, earlier of a different design. Now we have school-made planters and various other things. Now when children observe this without taking an arts class or a session for a year, you have told the child that what we teach you, what we ask you to do, we also implement it. So similarly, this group of children that is at the early education stage, I feel that parents are a very important component in their life. And when I talk to them, I realize, Mummy ne aisa kaha tha. my father told me like this. So this is what we are trying to battle with them. So we orient the parents also to a larger extent. So we prepared a group of parents who were like-minded with our curriculum. They keep coming to our school and talk about various kinds of issues that we have. 
and do it with children and explain to them as they view it through their glasses and they realize that what the child might need because their own one of the child is there in the class so they know exactly what 24/7 is the question and the query that they go through when they're talking to the child so parent community is extremely essential when we're talking about the pre primary stage and we make sure that's one of the programs i'm sure um, my both panelists will have a lot of time to talk about various other kinds of program that they might be doing the middle school that when we talk about is basically looking forward for competitions it's looking forward for generating debates it's looking forward to do something and show it and showcase to a little larger group in a smaller form that is inside the four walls and that's how we work with them in the form of clubs we work with them in the form of reports we work with them in the form of writing newsletters and various other things and they come up with a lot of stem programs and they are part of various other programs uh, at the local as well as the global level the the real crux of the entire generation which we are going to look uh, look forward in few 5 6 years is that other children from 9 to 12 they need to understand and get rebellious about this um, climate change action in the sense positively by making sure how important plantation is i've seen boys and girls looking forward to the uniform sometimes you know hum gande to nahi ho rahe i'm not getting i hope i'm not getting dirty you know they have to they have to be realizing that if there's no water to wash those clothes which the roots of these plants would hold for you you wouldn't be able to wash your dress again you know you wouldn't be able to use the water in your house if you are not able to naturally convert the conserve the way it is required so i believe in two aspects here i do a very strong collaboration locally and globally i make sure children come and stay in my school that is a stay in the school uh, the students house and they talk about what is our problem and what's their problem it's in the curriculum it's in their subject that they have to discuss about and they come to know oh, we have a common problem and when they think about that common problem they try to find solutions available as per their locality so a child from uk talks about a problem which is again to do with water and weather but they know a different way how to resolve it and they take it from our children our children have the similar problem they use another way how to utilize or how to resolve that problem and then they continue doing it throughout the year through either a blog or a website or a chat or a teacher as a mentor or a moderator in between and they start completing their task so i think these are three important things that we do but we make sure to every child to whatever stage they are try to understand the fact where are you at the moment try to understand where you want to reach once you understand these two aspects how you have to do it will become very easy that is how my entire interpretation of using um, climate action as one of the most important criteria for an individual to go ahead as a citizen to apply in future is thank you so much thank you so much ma'am i think uh, using student exchange programs to cross germinate ideas of climate action is i think brilliant uh, that that's something i'm sure every member of the audience is going to take away most of the students uh, mr ray i'll come to you next sir you have the unique advantage of having vishwa bharati background which means nature was all around you it was never a separate event in school and then going on to teach in such educational institutions and now sir at the protesh institute how do you positively affect climate action with your students i uh, at the moment i'm not uh, involved with any particular school as such however my work at present is very interesting because it influences or inspires policy making in education and i would like to bring in a little uh, twist in what has been um, discussed by the people by the experts uh, the colleagues uh, on the panel tonight every point that they have made is valid however and it's not only uh, general uh generally that i am speaking uh, i see it all over the world 
The problem is that we respond to a problem. We allow the problem to come up and then we expect people to solve it for us. That is where the basic problem lies. I mean, the main thing that education must do for a child is to make him or her fall in love with life, fall in love, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. Okay, now the point is that I have a fear that my kind will come to an end and that's why I do certain things to ensure that my progeny lives. This is something that all of us do, but that is not the real education that we are looking at. We must be looking at making children fall in love with life, despite the fact that what we have left to them is not often very lovable, but we need to make them understand that it is their love for others, it is their love for themselves, it is their love for everything that makes life so beautiful. This is the main thing that would make life sustainable for them. And one of the biggest conflicts is the fact that we as adults inflict ourselves, our thinking on the children. Though we say, uh, <clears throat> and we believe, and we hope fervently that uh, today's children will be our messiahs, will take us out of these troubles. But we cannot inflict old thinking on them if they have to think in a particular manner, they have to develop their own thinking, their own rationale for thinking in a particular way. I cannot teach anyone anything. That is where I start from. I can make people want to learn. So learning is far more important to me than teaching. And it's the perspective of the child who is not so much of what we understand to be as a child. I mean, the child can understand the world as uh, competently as we can at his or her level. It has the breadth of vision. We must have the fullest belief in that. And we know that our alternatives have not worked. Therefore, we have to get them ready for newer alternatives. Now, coming back to the basic problem that man has always faced. Man-made world versus the natural world. The moment it becomes versus, the moment there is a conflict between the two, there is a problem. The thing is that when we try to lord over natural environment, rather than utilize the power of nature. And that is when things start going wrong. And it is 
something of a human attitude. This we must recognize. And if we have to fight against something, it is first and foremost greed in the human being, which is the cause of all this inequity, which is the cause of all the problems that we have today. In fact, climate action, if we didn't think in a very, very self-centered manner, the need for climate action wouldn't have arisen. We think of personal comforts only. We think that we are the people who must be ruling the entire chain of life. We are not magnanimous enough to understand that even the mosquito is required in this chain. You know, um, <clears throat> the thing is that every thing in life has its own place. And when a child learns how to love, the child would, without fail, share things with the people who he loves or she loves. The child would make enough space for every element of life, of creation, to have its own place in the, uh, you know, um, entire scenario in the entire universe. Which is why I need to say that spiritual understanding of the oneness that leads to love is very, very important. Of course, religion should not come into school teaching as such. We are seeing how the entire framework in, uh, of India is being um, completely laid to waste by this kind of religious indoctrination. So education cannot be indoctrination. It, want, it must make people think. It must make young people love every element of life. Only then there can be sustainability. I mean, if you look at the 17 SDGs, education comes much before climate action. And we must understand that, that SDG number four, which is education, that in itself, if done properly, will stop this complete uh, how do I put it, this uh, problem of climate change. Of course, it cannot stop any longer. We have to deal with problems, we have to problem solve. But unless we have a very, very clear commitment, which comes out of love for life, rather than the fear of what will happen to me. This commitment is something that we hope that the new ways of teaching, rather learning uh, more than teaching, the new ways of learning would bring about amongst students. That is where 
the entire experience of Shantiniketan or a school like Dune leads because people can choose, people can learn what they want. And at the same time, the entire ecosystem of the school, it takes you towards the right values of uh, collaborative living. Okay, so specifically, of course, there are many, many things that are being done by schools, like saying no to plastics, uh, recycling of various things, then, um, I mean, they've been uh, taught to do certain things, unfortunately, uh, because exams and scoring marks in exams is so tremendously important in the present scenario. And we, despite what we may believe in as teachers, we cannot deny the fact that we have to teach them how to score good marks in exams. We don't really give them a feel of real life as Ms. Oja and the two previous speakers uh, have all pointed out being part and parcel of the natural world of being able to enjoy every aspect of natural world has to, has to, has to be part of the curriculum. Many, many things have come to us through books and they make sense only when we write those things as answers to questions in exams and they don't really matter in our lives. There are too many things like this because of this exam orientation that kills the desire to know, the curiosity in the child to be in sync with life. And that is where the problem lies because it makes the child apathetic. There's an apathy towards reading, you'd see. Uh, I read only to get myself ready to write exams and score good marks. Hardly anyone reads anymore uh, for the sake of reading good literature. And uh, I mean, the whole system needs to gear up to sustainability and sustain my interest in life is the first thing that we must inculcate amongst our children. Uh, and it's not just only science uh, or humanities, it's more importantly, music, sports, then of course, uh, theater, painting, and all these finer aspects of life that give the human being the height of seeing himself or herself as a creator of some kind. Once you get the feel of being a creator and then playing in teams or playing individually, the differences between the two, this actually gives you 
the feel that I am also part of creation and there's something beyond me. I belong to that, that belongs to me and we have to ensure that both of us survive happily. So that is what needs to be uh, inculcated through the whole business of education. This is what I believe. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to put forward my views. And I'm really, really uh, honored to be part of this panel of really competent experts in the sphere of education. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. The privilege is all ours to play host to uh, such wonderful thoughts every week. Uh, but we are not letting you go yet. I will have more questions for you in a bit. But I'll get across to Rajeshri ma'am first. Uh, ma'am, this is an interesting one. And this is something I've wondered since I was a child, right? Uh, futuristic dystopian movies showed massive cities turn into deserts. How do you teach a child in Rajasthan the terrible risk of everything turning into desert? Sure. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Roy, for putting that question and uh, helping me to put my thoughts together because the question helps to address uh, the concern. So uh, good evening once again to all the esteemed panelists. And uh, here I am. Uh, I would like to quote two things. Uh, in fact, like uh, I would like to uh, pay my gratitude to these two elements who helped me to uh, contribute towards uh, whatever climate change or uh, whatever would you say, uh, the, the SDG uh, elements. I was able to teach to the children. And those two people, are one is uh, the owners, the trustees and the board members of the school who envisioned the school 30 years back. And the elements that they put into the school. Uh, today, I am able to relate much more than ever that how important it is to keep these things in mind when you are building up school. Because uh, school is not just the building, it is like what exactly the child is going to learn over there. And 30 years back, uh, the owners uh, had put in the rainwater harvesting system. They had put in uh, the, what do you say, uh, the solar panels, then the way the washrooms have been done. So all those aspects had been taken care of 30 years back, which I'll uh, share with you all the eight, nine things which I could jot down, especially when Mr. Barrett was talking. And I was thinking that, oh, did we both share the list of things that the schools do? And uh, I'd love to share those uh, points. The other person and the community, the association that I would like to talk about is the CSE, uh, the Center of Science and Environment in Delhi. Uh, they do this um, green school audit. And we have been doing this audit for the last five, six years. And two years back, we were awarded as the change maker school because of certain elements that the school was uh, taking care of, which I'll share with you. So uh, this, I want to tell a little bit about this green school audit. It is an audit of the school where there are six elements that they take care of, which is air, energy, food, land, water, and the waste. How you manage all of these in the school and how you teach children, uh, more than teach as uh, Mr. Ray was again and again saying that you need to have the kids fall in love with certain things. So basically we tried doing that, Mr. Ray. We try having kids fall in love with the school and the, belong the belongingness uh, aspect, because then what happens, it's very easy to get away with these things that we want to teach them. So these are the six elements that the Green School Audit does. And how we uh, do it in our school is, uh, we have these six elements and we have our eco club. So we have a lot of children and we don't do it as a force element. The force element is uh, encouraging them to do certain things, but the uh, people, the children who opt for this eco club, they have divided into these six elements. So these children divided into th uh, six groups. 
they take care of these uh, elements that how conservation, reuse, recycle, uh, awareness is creating um, created amongst the children. So a uh, couple of things that uh, augment the water, which we have been talking about a lot, the ground level of the water is, one is we have a self-created jungle in the school, which is 20% of the land. When the owners, when they were building the school, they consciously left 20% of the land. And again, as you had asked, that how do you do it in Rajasthan? So in Rajasthan, that 20% of the land has been created into a jungle. 30 years back, those trees were planted. And today, they are big, huge, humongous trees. And there is a big, like if uh, people understand uh, Hindi, Bawdi ya jo rainwater harvesting, that um, talab kind of thing that we normally talk about, that was created 30 years back. So that actually gets filled up during the rains and it regenerated, re regenerates the groundwater level and those trees. And that's how that jungle, we never water that jungle. So the entire year, that uh, rainwater harvesting system takes care of that jungle. So that is one thing and kids love going there. Kids love finding out that is there any tree which is like uh, getting old. Uh, we also get a lot of pesticides into these trees, demug that we call. So kids take care of that also. So kids also plant trees in that jungle. On their birthdays, uh, we gift every child a tree, a sapling, which is normally a neem tree because that's the best which grows in Rajasthan and doesn't need much of water. So this jungle keeps on having new trees by the kids on their birthdays. And kids love going there. We have a lot of classes in the jungle area. Then we have a well, which is again 30 year old well. We don't use the water of that well. That well is again, just to maintain the water level of the, that area. Uh, that is a covered well and uh, again, the kids, they know that how much water is in there because when they do the green school audit, when they do the water audit, they do the audit that how much water is stored in that well or in that uh, rainwater harvesting tub. And they, uh, they're supposed to prepare a report. There are uh, graphics that they are supposed to prepare and send to the CSET. So those are the things that we do. Then uh, for uh, washrooms, the washrooms have been built in such a manner that there is a small little basin in the line of cubicles. And when the kid is going to wash their hands, that water is not going to go into the drain. Instead, it goes into those cubicles. And the water runs through those cubicles and then goes into the drain. And that drain is connected to, again, a piece of land. So we try to uh, reuse, consume, and uh, monitor our water at the uh, maximum level. Then uh, the, our water hut, which is the RO plant. Again, whatever wastewater which comes out from there, it is again, there is a small tubule which has been put on that. That water is used to plant the trees. All this is managed by the children. In the sense, they take care of that, how much water is being consumed, how much water is, is the motor gone wrong, if there's something that needs to be done. So the children who are taking care of the land and the water segment from the green school audit, they take care of this. Then uh, we have, uh, as Mr. Barrett was talking, and uh, uh, I think Mr. Ray also did mention about the organic uh, garden. We have a organic vegetable garden, again, maintained by the children. Uh, the organic uh, uh, kitchen waste as uh, in their bags, in their polythene bags. They contribute that as uh, like um, if they've not done homework. So that's the punishment that if you've not done your homework, you're supposed to bring kitchen waste from this home and they dump it there. That garden is again maintained by the children. Then we have uh, kids uh, who come on bicycles. We prefer the kids who are staying close by should not take the bus, rather uh, opt for coming on bicycles. Then we have solar panels, which takes care of uh, the electricity. And again, the children do uh, the audit of that as well, that how much there was uh, the year we got the award for the change maker school. We used to have these uh, uh, bulbs and tube lights in the classrooms. 
So the kids had come up because every year we need to add something to that green school audit to continue getting that certification. So uh, the kids, every time they come up with new ideas that how can we make more changes or how can we uh, get, do the things even better. So they came up with this idea of changing all the lights and going into those LEDs to uh, reduce the electricity bill. So they went to the level that now we don't pay any electricity bill because our solar panels, they take care of the entire electricity of the school. Uh, the senior kids who are part of this eco club, they are our cheerleaders. Our teachers don't talk much about these things. Our children talk that uh, to the younger lot that this is what you're supposed to do because if you want to continue, if we want to continue getting this award, we need to continue uh, bringing things into the system. So we actually work with that team, the audit team, and that team actually works with the children down uh, till the primary, pre primary. They are the ones who encourage them. Then again, like bringing plastic to school, we, we have uh, told our children not to bring even the plastic tiffin box. 90% of our children, they use the steel tiffin box. We used to have a canteen in the school. The kids came up and they said, uh, ma'am, why don't we do away with it? We don't want a canteen. Instead, you can do a canteen for us just on a Saturday. And that canteen also, the menu is prepared by the children. And mostly the menu is uh, taking care of two aspects. One, the green aspect, and the second one, not to use too much of money. So the only two things that we uh, offer at the canteen is a bhel and a samosa. No paper, no plate, nothing. The kid has to bring their tiffin, take whatever bhel or samosa they wish to. Again, this is done by the kids. They were the ones who came up with the menu. They are the ones who uh, told us not to do the canteen. Uh, plantation of the trees, I did mention about. Uh, I think I've said enough uh, to your question, Roy. Ma'am, uh, when we are, we are planning an inter-school quiz sometime during this year, uh, I would like a photo of your school, which shows the organic garden, the lake, and the forest. My question to the students would be, guess which state this is from? And I can sorry. guarantee sorry, my sorry, question. Come again. Yeah. I will show that picture and ask the students, guess which state this is from. And I want to like, check out how many of them said Rajasthan. This did not sound like the image of Rajasthan most of us carry in our heads. Sure, sure, sure. I think uh, it's wonderful. Share the pictures of the school as well. I mean, uh, when I joined the school, uh, when I was uh, coming to the school, I was thinking I am actually from Rajasthan and I'm from Junjunu, which is again, a very arid area. Greenery is very hardly uh, seen. So I had the similar um, thing in mind that it's going to be something similar. But the minute I entered the school, I was like, no, I, this is not Rajasthan. This cannot be Rajasthan. And everything is like owned by the kids. The kids uh, take ownership of doing every single bit of uh, which the school management had put together 30 years back, the kids, they, they really feel uh, that it belongs to them. So they are the ones who every time come up with new ideas and uh, share that, okay, can we do this? Can we do this? And that's how we keep building on it. Wonderful. Man. Uh, I think this has been some fantastic inputs. Because of paucity of time, I'm just going to take one more question and go around the table with it. Uh, given the pandemic this is going on, and this is a question that we had from one of the attendees, uh, given the pandemic that is going on, uh, is climate action going to take a backseat? Is greater access to technology going to help it? Uh, last year, there was a lot of talk about how people staying indoors had reduced the carbon footprint of the country. Uh, are we going to see something similar? Are people going to be more aware? That's my question. How is pandemic going to impact climate action? Uh, Dr. Preeti, if I may come to you first. Um, that's an excellent question because when uh, lockdown happened uh, last year, the first post that I saw on the Facebook was uh, of a city in Chandigarh where there were a lot of animals on the road and uh, there was there was a lot of peace around. Nobody was, none of them were scared and things were looking very, very nice to look at when we were on that post. And when I talk to children, when I talk to people around, when I talk to my parents, when I talk to the management, I get to know that now they can see the natural beauty coming back around us. I can I can see a lot of birds around. 
the house when we spoke to our third to fifth grade children they said that they can see a lot of other kinds of small insects and creatures which they had only seen in comics and books and now they can actually see them on the floor and various other places so i think it will definitely let and allow the parent and the student the child to understand that we need to now live with only needs the want has to be reduced because somewhere we as adults have to understand that we are borrowing a lot from the next generation and we are depleting a lot of other things which they need in the future we wouldn't want them with an oxygen cylinder going inside a metro which which scares me in an ad and i i think that that's not going to be a human race which is going to be working ahead for which we always keep our collar high it's going to be a, a age of clones and people with very mechanical thought process with less emotion which will which will actually uh, make a different kind of a world altogether which is not the need at all what i think is the generation from where i come and even my father's generation we had a lot of struggle of basic needs so we used a lot of resources of the environment but when we come as an educationist in the school we see that most of our teachers who are newcomers as well as children who are at the senior classes have their basic needs in place and they want a quality life so we need to let them know quality has to be again margined with a thin line of how much need is of a quality life and how much is a want the minute the child understands that what's the difference between a need and a want which they might be on daily routine while they are staying at home when there's no milk in the milk booth they will understand i can't stay without milk also which was as a ritual from my mother and grandmother to have in the morning so in case i want to have it let me now wait for one day alternative to have something else natural resources to eat will become uh, as a should become a greater need for a consumer You, you know we eat chips we eat pizza we eat processed food so these companies and manufacturing industries are moving towards a different kind of a world which is bringing a lot of weather change the emotional aspect of the children is also changing when you eat things which are genetically grown or which are being used with some kind of chemicals which is not required for this human brain i see a lot of children very aggressive at the age of uh, 12 to 18 where it was not required earlier the aggression when i talk to the parents and ma'am would understand this better being a counselor and a psychologist that whenever my counselors and everybody they sit there they say the eating habit is very difficult to organize their brain and their thoughts because they most of the time having a lot of non veg food which is which is eating a lot of things from the environment which is not good for the child the the, the emotional aspect of child is thinking so when children now will be sitting at home and the mothers will be cooking for them and helpers are in coming the natural food that they would be giving you know most of the time all all of us are working so i give my son a fruit and milk in the morning whereas we used to give him a paratha in the morning so now there's a change in the routine which will help him also to realize and he is realizing that he's become thinner and he's become smarter and he's finding more energy to sit and study and he's able to concentrate on various other Uh, platforms where he used to participate earlier with a better vigilance so i think it will very slowly but it will do come in the society through this pandemic which i take as an opportunity for a climate change among the people because the cars are not there on the road the pollution is very less the rain that we had suddenly of a week back was uh, very pleasant the the weather that i see i never seen it in the month of april and I, i'll tell you the difference that lockdown was taken up on 29th of july last year and after that again the pollution and the intensity of it rose it was rising the the diwali was told not to be played with crackers but then there were some of the uh, areas where i could hear the sound and i could hear people playing diwali i was like why are we not holding ourselves by doing culturally a different way of celebrating things when we know that the natural resources will be disturbed you know and it is not only a school which can teach you know a very old saying that a village takes to educate a child it is uh, it is the father it's the mother it's the child it's the headmaster it's the um, and it's the helper it's everybody in the family 
who now children will try to understand the uh, need of all these things around them and i think that will help them and it will definitely bring a, a little bit of thinking that if i can be without it for a year i think i can manage without it for a long time bring a lot of change thank you so much ma'am uh, i can completely relate to that bit about you know how pollution reduced and increased i do some amateur sky watching and uh, what that typically means is put the telescope in the car and drive out to the city if you need to see anything clearly at night suddenly from the city of calcutta i could look up and see stars the skies had cleared up up to about july and then it became worse uh, so very relatable there rajesh ma'am if i may come to you with the same question do you think the the focus on the pandemic and the situation we have at hand will take away focus from climate action no i don't think so in fact uh, the focus has gone on to uh, the climate all the more uh, i'll give my own example i have a kitchen garden and uh, since last 3 years when there was no pandemic or anything i did not even know that uh, there was a lemon tree behind my like in my kitchen garden and there was a jamun tree there, there has been like there are two jamun trees and i would not know when the flower would come when the fruit would come and just disappear because most of the time i would be like during the day in the school and then by the evening would not have enough time i stay alone here so but this time in this pandemic time i could realize because i was watering the trees also and i realized i uh, actually did uh, almost 15 kg of lemon achar myself this time i uh, had somewhere around 20 kg of uh, jamun which i distributed all around the place so i was wondering that these were the things which were just outside my door which i never noticed which i did not ever pay attention i never knew that what kind of birds were coming to my kitchen garden and now it's like i literally feel i had literally have a conversation with the quails it looks as if they are asking me something i'm replying back to them so i do this uh, conversation with the kids also and the feelings are same they feel the same they they tell us that uh, they have been like planting Uh, vegetables or things in pots or in small little uh, areas whatever small little area they have they have been uh, creating bird feeders so i think this is going to bring the climate uh, awareness even more than uh, earlier times and i hope this i mean uh, the pandemic should not stay the virus should not be there but such situations should be there where see the focus uh, was not on education alone the focus was on many other things the kids were home the kids were spending time with parents so i feel that this kind of routine should be actually implemented in schools where there is a lot of free time for the kids to think and to do certain things of this sort i think we've lost rajesh ma'am's signal for a bit we we'll just wait for to join back mr ray if i may come to you in the meanwhile uh i i uh, committed an error there before uh, mr ray starts where i was introducing him i forgot to tell people that the pratich institute the institute that mr ray works for where he is the executive director was actually uh, set up by uh, the nobel laureate who actually took the nobel honorarium and set up pratich institute with him and that i think is a fantastic fantastic move yes mr ray Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I feel honored to work with uh, Professor Amartya Sen. I have learned a lot uh, because, I mean, as a teacher, as an educator, as a learner myself, I understand one thing: that you can turn. and that is what gives me hope we human beings are equipped to turn any uh, problematic situation into something that could give us chances to better ourselves so i mean uh, <clears throat> 
the whole idea of uh, you know trying to overcome problems gives you an understanding a of what you are missing which is happening with the covid and i'm sure uh, that lots and lots of ma'am uh, uh, mrs uh, ms shahag you uh, will bear me out that <clears throat> this kind of isolation if i may call it is causing a lot of uh, mental ill health right and yet we are looking at the silver lining and trying to figure out how we could use this as an opportunity to better ourselves and this is coming because all of us love life with whatever its deficiencies may be we still want this life we love this life and i think uh, this is what happens when i look up at the sky as uh, shubhayu was saying you look up at the sky in kolkata of course i am right now stuck stuck in dehradun uh, because of the covid uh, the sky here is far 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 clearer but i was like amazed uh, a few months ago to see that yeah you can uh, without a telescope you can see stars in the calcutta sky so and like uh, um, all of you are saying that there are so many things that we took for granted we have learned to appreciate that and this is something i think which i again i echo the feelings of my co panelists uh, saying i don't want the uh, pandemic to stay but in certain ways it's going to leave its mark not only on one generation but quite a few generations to come and uh, we were talking about before this pandemic of uh, the only uh uh thing that is uh constant in the 21st century is change this whole idea has now gone to a different level and then we will come up these kids in schools will come up with new management techniques and uh, you know knowledge of that can be applied to real life and uh, change management would become uh, much much uh, more fruitful so i think very clearly that uh, it will not take away from the uh in fact i know of certain people that uh, <clears throat> actually are working on the possibility of whether this uh pandemic is an offshoot of global warming and things of that kind there is research going on on this and therefore uh i don't think uh 
there is any any fear of uh, losing sight of what the climate is going through and what action we must take to ensure that uh, things don't go from bad to worse. We'll be always responsible for that. Let's hope so. And that is where the hope begins. Wonderful, sir. Uh, on that hopeful note, I'll just come back to Rajeshri, ma'am. Sorry, ma'am, we lost connection with you for a second there. Uh, if you would want to complete. You would have to unmute yourself. Huh? I just wanted to add uh, two points to the question that was asked, that what can be done while we are at home to be able to teach children. So uh, while being like associated with CSE, uh, there was one thing that uh, they did with the, the schools who were associated with them was uh, the waste management. They did a little webinar for the kids and then the kids were supposed to maintain a journal where they were supposed to write down uh, what kind of waste was being produced at home, how that waste can be segregated and how the kitchen waste can be used into the kitchen garden as a menu. So uh, that is one thing that we can teach our children, uh, which is something which kids are going to enjoy at the same time they learn something about it. And the other thing that we could do was how green are we as an audit? So we can have kids to identify, see what kind of trees they have around, what kind of plants they have around. And because of those certain trees and plants, there are certain birds and insects that come around. So these are the things that can be done while still being home, which will indirectly uh, teach them uh, things regarding the climate change. Wonderful, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I wish we could go on for longer. We have a few questions that we wish we could answer on the panel, but we will have to call it a close for the day. But thank you. Thank you so much for sparing your time and this wonderful, wonderful discussion. I will let Ochin do the formal thanking bit, but this has been an absolute pleasure and privilege hosting all of you. Ochin, over to you. A really wonderful session, Shuvayu. Like, uh, must say, great session. And uh, uh, some very good uh, points uh, were discussed. I think uh, a very all-round perspective of things. And uh, some great takeaways for our esteemed audience as well. But sir, uh, thank you so much for giving us a great start as always. And uh, for some great examples, you know, uh, uh, from, your, from your long illustrious career, some very nice examples you quoted, I think, which really perfectly uh, set the stage uh, for the entire discussion. Uh, Dr. Oja, I, I really thank you uh, for, for uh, highlighting some very uh, important points. I think two, uh, two things that you mentioned, ma'am, uh, really stays with us. One is uh, the fact that uh, in, in, in the new world, uh, really we need to live with needs. And at some point of time, we really need to distinguish between needs and wants. I think that's a very, very important point that you, that you made, very thought-provoking point, I must say you know, leaves uh, scope for a lot of thought. And also, I guess, uh, uh, I think you're completely right in, in when, when you uh, highlighted uh, certain aspects, which are so important, like, for instance, uh, uh, even during this worst humanitarian crisis that you have seen, which, of course, uh, and now with the second wave rising, uh, undoubtedly very, very tragic. But uh, certain aspects that you highlighted, like uh, the fact that, uh, again, we have seen uh, nature, we have seen nature, natural beauty coming back, birds around us. So definitely these are, uh, I'll say, um, these are uh, things that all of us really, really, you know, uh, cherish. But having said that, uh, the fact that now with second wave coming in and with so much of tragedy all around us, undoubtedly, like this is one thing that uh, as uh, from, from, from the side of notebook, our thoughts and prayers with each and every student and each and every academician, each and every educator across the country, and uh, for every every citizen of our great nation. Indeed, we are in this in this, in this crisis together, hand in hand, and we really look forward to better times. Uh, Mr. Ray, uh, thank you, sir. Some very very nice uh, 
points i guess uh, you made which really stays with us i think the fact the way you started man made world versus uh, natural world i think very very thought provoking undoubtedly and uh, also the fact that uh, the, the way you connected the finer aspects of life and their importance be it music sports uh, theater and how it really goes on uh, goes on to connect a child and make him feel uh, make him feel that the gives him the feel of being a creator and how it really helps in him connecting with, his, with the larger ecosystem i think very very important point and also at the end i think you made a great point that we have really we have learned and this is one of the hard lessons uh, of this unfortunate uh, pandemic we have learned to appreciate things that we earlier took for granted i think undoubtedly that 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 that's the message raishi ma'am uh, thank you thank you and some uh, i think uh, really uh, very interesting and insightful to know about your school the fact that your uh, the fact that uh, your founders of the school the promoters that the vision and that to 30 years back is something which is commendable i must say i really really appreciate this and i think your uh, like as a speaker whatever you shared today in this platform has been so appropriate it really enhanced the takeaway of the entire webinar so really uh, fascinating to know about the rainwater harvesting solar panels and the fact that mini jungle being created in 20% area and how children are taking care of it the most important part i'll say how they're involved i think there couldn't be a better way to connect them to nature and the kind of responsibility they have shown be it in terms of doing away with the canteen only once a week and other aspects and also on a lighter note uh, uh, really impressed to know about your kitchen garden and especially about your uh, you know a lemon and jamuns and the thought and the fact that you really converse with the birds with, with the quails i i must like i think as uh, priti ma'am also i saw her chat that really ma'am you live in heaven and i couldn't agree more and out really great great so i think uh, uh, it has been a, it has been a very uh, nice session very insightful session i thank members of the esteemed audience for their time as well for being with us here today uh, stay safe take care goodbye